Hello and welcome to another episode of Who Knew in the Moment, the podcast. I'm your host, Phil Friedrich, and today I am honored to have Marcy Zeroff with me. Marcy is the founder and CEO of Eco Fashion Corp. And a phrase she has, and I think it's going to come out in our conversation today, is <laughs> serving others is serving oneself. And I think that's pretty darn true to where she's at. And then something unique about her, uh, one of her favorite snacks is dairy-free vegan chocolate. So I, I don't know where one <laughs> finds this. So I'm going to have to go ahead and start like Googling or Amazoning it to find it, but that is a favorite snack. So if you want to send her a gift, send her a boatload of that. Marcy, thanks for being on today. Thank you for having me, Phil. That was definitely a first in the introductions <laughs> to me. <laughs> Good find, like one of those hit one of those hidden secrets, you know, guilt free indulgence, name of the game. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, Marcy, I want to start off in your story uh, with growing up, and as a kiddo, you had lemonade stands and you got into calligraphy. <laughs> so, talk a little bit about being young and having kind of that entrepreneurial mindset, even at a young age. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was always that kid that, you know, was kind of creating businesses. And, you know, I think I inherited that drive from my mom, who was kind of a, um, a stifled entrepreneur, a product of her generation that gave up, you know, her career to have children and sort of was living vicariously through me, always empowering me to do something different. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I had, you know, I had business cards when I was 11, you know, and I was literally, I was the kid, as you mentioned, with the lemonade stand. But, um, you know, for me, being in business was kind of, I was wired that way, right? It was always about coming up with ideas, figuring out how to, how to make them happen. Um, and when I was 16 years old, a girlfriend of mine gave me a book called Living in the Light by Shakti yeah. Gawain. And that book really just like, that was my aha moment where I said, the power of business to change the world goes so much further beyond what we can see, because really that's the premise of the book, right? We, you know, we all get drawn into that, what we see, but there's something yeah. deeper behind everything. And that set me on my journey for the past 30 plus years, really just um, on every level. And my mentor of over 25 years in business um, has been the founder of Aveda, who Horst Reckelbacher, who I met when I was actually in my late teens at an environmental conference, because I was that kid that was like, once I sort of had that aha moment, I just, you know, like a sponge, I bought all kinds of books and I was going to conferences and I just on a personal level was reading and trying to learn about, you know, spirituality and conscious living and environmentalism. And I became a vegetarian at the age of 16 and I started doing yoga you know, back in the day when nobody knew what it was. And, you know, I was like really passionate about organic agriculture and people thought I was being brainwashed. And, you know, so, it, you know, just all these things just started hitting me and going like, oh my gosh, this is, this makes sense. And as, the more that resonated, the more I was like, I need to do something about this. And therein lies my, you know, trajectory into serving others is serving myself because we're all in this together. So there's so many things to unpack there, but one thing that I'd like to ask about is, all right, so I'm 16 years old, you know, 16 is that interesting time of life where, you know, you're just trying to figure yourself out, right? You're wanting to socially fit in, but you were willing to step into things that maybe weren't the socially normal, certainly, but certainly at that age and that time frame, maybe not even widely accepted. So what about it for maybe your confidence? You know, how did you derive the confidence to be able to step out and do things against the grain, even at that time of uh, life? You know, it's really funny. And I look back, you know, at all the friends I've accumulated throughout my many, many years of life. And mm. my best friends today are some of the people that I met when I was in my teens, mm. that I was just drawn to very, very intuitively. And as I look at their lifestyles and my lifestyle today, we're all in sync. So, you know, I think even though I was all, you know, and I grew up in South Florida, it was like the antithesis of a, you know, progressive environment, trust me. But, you know, I found my people, right? Like yeah. I found those who, who kind of spoke a similar language that we just were on the same wavelength, like soul connected. Yeah. And, and so those friends are, you know, friends that are in, you know, sustainability or fashion or yoga teachers or, you know, social workers, because they're about consciousness and, you know, emotional health and mind body. So, you know, it's, 
I just, I always st stood true to my vision. You know, once I sort of got it, and I believe this inherently that once you plant that seed of consciousness in somebody and they have that awakening, you know, yeah. you can't go, you don't go backwards. Once you get something, once you get that climate change is real, or you get that eating healthier food is going to make a difference on your own personal state of health and well-being. Once you get that you you can vote with your dollars and you can play a role in driving change, even at the smallest level as an individual, you don't turn that off, right? Because it's intuitive on who we are as human beings, right? We don't want to do bad. We want to feel good. We want to align our personal and our professional values. And ultimately in business, we want to do well by doing good in the world. We don't want to destroy and deplete and you know, and, and degrade, which is why a lot of people are jumping ship out of their old school companies now right. and seeking companies with purpose. It's like there's a revolution going on, you know, because people are now wanting more in the choices that they make. That's so true. That's so true. Now, you mentioned a, an important connection. I want to highlight this. So you went to a conference and yeah, the owner or the founder of Aveda is there. So talk about that first interaction. Did you know going there you wanted to reach out? How did they take you seriously at as young of an age as you were? Talk just a little bit about that dynamic and how it uh, started. So the same girlfriend that gave me the book Living in the Light was actually a hairdresser. She was six years older than me. And I met her because sitting in her chair, we just like became fast friends. And she was introduced to Aveda when there was one product. Wow. So one day she actually said to me, Marcy, you have to smell this brand that someone just, this new distributor just said, oh, you have to try this. And I was like, <gasps> and it was the same thing as the visual, right? Or the taste, right? Like I call it the yes and movement, yeah. right? It starts with the yes. In food, it has to taste good. And then the Oh, by the way, the and is it's healthier, you know, it's cleaner, non-toxic, organic, regenerative, all, you know, fair trade. The beauty products, the yes, is scent and functionality. You have to lead with that. And then the and is, oh, by the way, as Horst in Aveda would yeah. talk about plant-based wisdom, ancient healing traditions, indigenous cultures. And I would read the packaging after smelling the product. And I just, I was like, whoa, like this is exactly, <laughs> yeah. this is amazing. So I just got inspired by his mindset. And when I met him, I knew who he was. Um, I caught, you know, I'm sure I, I made my way over to him right away, started yeah. talking. And I think he saw in me and I, you know, I, and I say this, you know, from a place of like just deep appreciation and love for him. I think he saw in me kind of a protege, like I had the same ideas as we started talking that he had, and we became very, very close friends and through the years um, collaborated many, many times. In fact, he helped me open my first business. Um, he was, we opened an Aveda concept salon together in my school. I did a, I started the first um, health and wellness educational center in 1990. Uh, which is known today as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, the world's largest holistic nutrition school and has certified over 170,000 people worldwide as health coaches in, I think, 140 countries around the world now, something yeah. like that. So, um, so, but he came and helped me find my first space. We went and I started educating at the Aveda Institutes about health and wellness from a food standpoint. So we started connecting the dots between food and beauty as soon as we met. Because he got the food side and I got the beauty side and we're like, let's, let's one plus one equals 11. Let's yeah. put our worlds together. I always say that number because it's my favorite number. And synchronistically, Horst was born on 1111. <laughs> and even further synchronistically, I got married on 111111 at his house on his birthday and he was my best man. And then fast forward, Horst um, wrote the forward to my book, Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world. Um, and then he passed away and I dedicated my book to him and spoke at his funeral. And wow. so I just feel so grateful to have had such a force in my life. Yes, absolutely. The power of a mentor, right? No question, especially Love. someone someone with that kind of genius that he never really sat down and taught me. It didn't yeah. work like that. It was just 
watching him, learning from him, spending time with him. I spent a lot of time with him through the years. I'm still very close with, you know, his wife um, that, you know, she, she ended up getting remarried, but um, and I'm you know, close with her new husband too. But I, but I, you know, love hang, spending time with them and just um, being around a language. And, mm. and to this day, you know, I can travel all over the world and find people who are speaking the same language, even though we speak different languages, you know what I mean? And it's just the, it's the language of what I call good business, right? The five P's people, planet, profit, passion, and purpose, no compromise. Yes. And that's so good. I love it. So you fast forward a little bit. I want to just figure out how we got there. So you're in Florida you decide you're going to go to school at UC Berkeley. So we're going to head across the, the country. So talk a little bit about what ended up driving you there. I mean, obviously a phenomenal school, but what was, you know, the driving force that got you there? And then, yeah, talk about uh, graduating and starting your business from there. So when I was, um, I think also around 16, I did a cross country bus tour with a bunch of youth and um I was on the Berkeley campus and I had this like, this is it. This is like, there was again, because that was like right around the time that I was having my own awakening because I'd read the book, I became vegetarian, I started yoga. And when I got to Berkeley and I just, it was like, I was like a flower child, like business girl, you know, like, I mean, even to this day, I kind of bridge like the tree hugger and the fashionista, (laughs) right? Like the tribe and the boardroom, like I can be in a boardroom with, you know, 50, you know, or whatever to uh, men in suits. And then I could be a burning man and I can be equally as comfortable just have letting go and being like in my community with my people, you know, like, so like all, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, Berkeley really resonated because it was one of the best schools in the country, academically, intellectually, but also artistically, spiritually, Mm. it really drew me. And so I also, the main reason that I was like, yes, is back, I went to school in 1985, not again, not to age myself. I was three years old when I left for college, by the way. (laughs) Um, But, but no, I, you know, and I wanted to be a computer science major. So um, Berkeley had one of the best computer science programs in the country. Yeah. And we're talking mid eighties when Apple was just starting and all these. And I, I went into the computer science, I got into Berkeley and I was a computer science major for two years before applying to Haas Business School. So that was really kind of the, the ultimate like catalyst was all the pieces fit the weather, the California girl in me, the spiritual, like kind of conscious and enlightened environment that Berkeley could offer. And at the end of the day, the academics of computer science. Thank God for that bus trip. I love it. That that, (laughs) that took us out there. So as you're graduating from there, you know, you talked a bit about it, you start an institute. So talk just a little bit about, you know, what the mission behind that was originally. And then obviously, yeah, it's grown exponentially since you started that. Well, going back to when I said I embrace the lifestyle. So here I am, you know, going to Berkeley and, you know, my friends are like eating, you know, pizza and hot dogs. And and I'm like cooking like brown rice and vegetables and like, you know, and I'm eating like seaweed and quinoa and kale like long before anyone even knew what that was. (laughs) And people were always asking me like, what is that? Why are you eating that? Like, whoa. What, what do you call that? And I started taking people on like health food store tours, like, yeah. these, you know, crunchy old health food stores that were like very, um, you know, old school, right? Like long yeah. before, like people today, when they think, you know, a health food store, they think whole foods, right? right? But back then it was like that, you know, crunchy, overcrowded, dark, right? But like, I just, I knew the brands because I was yeah. always learning, trying, reading, absorbing. And so that's how it started. Then I was going to open a health food store when I moved to New York after I graduated college. I was going to open a big one. I had like traveled around and I found the the pockets of stores that were just all brew, starting to bud like the Whole Foods is of the world yeah. back in the, again, back in the late 80s. And then um, my financing sort of got bumped you know, and bumped ahead. And I was like, why wait? I'm going to start the educational component of the store and found my business partner, my co-founder of of IIN. And we started it out of my apartment, an educational program. And people just started growing very organically. And so I was cooking for people 
you know, on my personal time while I was an investment banker, while I was in college. Yeah. And th- so I already ha- like knew what people wanted to know, what they were asking. And that sort of, I stayed doing investment banking when I first moved to New York. And then I gave that up and went full steam ahead to scaling this whole concept of educating people, you know, in this whole journey and, and meeting people where they are. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's a big part of my life work is not about preaching. It's about teaching by example. It's about guiding people and when they're ready and how they're ready, but always doing it through the lens of just, you know, walking my talk and then, you know, planting seeds and cultivating them. And, and again, meeting people that everyone's somewhere different on the spectrum. You know, I don't want to impose my values and beliefs. I'm not judgmental. Um, I'm very inclusive in the way I think. And I do believe that everybody at some point in time, will have that seed planted in some way or another across, I don't know where, maybe it's food, maybe it's beauty, maybe it's fashion, maybe it's business, maybe it's art. Yeah. Um, and that's why, and that's why I wrote my book, Eco Renaissance, because it, yes. it touches on all of the spokes in the wheel of change. I love it. And folks, if you can't tell she's passionate about it, um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, rewind a little bit. So I do want to highlight that though. And I think, you know, for anyone that's a business owner, anyone that's stepping into something, um, if you have a really deep driven purpose for it, I think it's a lot easier to stay through in the tough times because yeah, it's easy to list off. Hey, there's 170,000 people have gone through this now, but at one point there was zero, right? And it was just an idea. And you were creating this new thing in a world where it wasn't super popular, right? It wasn't all over social media and things like that. So just talk about, (laughs) you know, how having that deep driven purpose can help get through the tough times of, you know, beginning a, a new venture. Yeah. Well, you know, I always loved Jonathan Swift. In fact, the school, when it first started, was called Gulliver's Living and Learning Center, inspired after Gulliver's Travels and taking people on a journey. And we would call ourselves the Living and Learning Center. And it would have like Lilliput Organic Cafe and all these different pieces. Um, But another one of my favorite quotes from Jonathan Swift is, vision is the art of seeing things invisible, Mm, right? So when you set a vision, The one thing that I've learned, and I'm kind of been a walking cliche throughout my career, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you smarter and stronger. (laughs) And one door closes, another one opens, right? Is this idea that when you set a vision, right? When you have purpose, as you just shared, you know, your your ultimate end game is much bigger than you. And therefore you don't get stuck in the tactics. Like I always say, don't get stuck in the muck, right? When you're creating a business, you have to become a professional pivoter, right? Yeah, because yeah. that's that's the that's the end of the day. That's the law of manifestation, right? Is yeah. understanding that we are made of energy and energy just wants to flow. So when you hit a wall, that's an energetic roadblock. And it's your you have to, as a good leader, know how to move around that block. It's yeah. not about, oh shit, I hit a block, I'm going to fall. It's about how do I get around it? How do I get over it? How do I get behind it and keep going? So yeah. I've, I think as I've gotten throughout my 30 year career, I've just gotten better and you know, at knowing like, I'm not going to try to, you know, fit this square peg in this round hole. Yeah. This is a sign. It's time to pivot. Boom. Let's go in, in a different direction. I love it. So the question that comes to mind for me, and I'm sure you've had this more times than you care to imagine, but it is how, how do you know when you're hitting a wall and it's meant to be a pivot or it's a wall that I just haven't broken through yet and I need to keep forging forward? What are some of the key indicators that you've used in your career uh, to discern on which spot I'm in on that? I think one um, thing that's important to just point out in that respect is to listen, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think we all have a habit of like wanting, and I'm, listen, I'm type A, you know, like (laughs) I want to, I, I'm very direct. I I have very strong ideas and I want to drive them forward, but I've also learned to like integrate and hear the signs. Like, so when Mm -hmm. other people are saying, you know, are you sure that that's the right way to go? Because, and, and I will do my own due diligence, Yes. right? I never, and I even tell this to other people, even with the, the school with IIN, we would say, don't believe anything we're telling you, just mm. try it, yeah. go home and try one thing, take one day a week, do one meal, you know, whatever it is, 
and just sit with it, reflect and think about how it makes you feel Mm. and then build on that. So I think for me, it's, it's been, it's just sort of learning how to integrate feedback and listening to, and also looking at the signs, looking at the metrics. I think another thing I've learned through the years is to set goals. It's not about ready, fire, aim. (laughs) about ready aim fire and i think you know entrepreneurs have a habit of just like hitting the ground and then not thinking about what the ramifications are and so yes you're going to hit walls right there's a lot of those examples out there really smart marketers who got in their own way like fire festival is the most you know (laughs) obvious example they had this brilliant idea but their execution was horrific because they didn't think through their plan and then and then build it in a methodical way to get to the end game, which could have been very successful, right? Yes. They just like shot too fast. So I think it's the, you've got to manage your, your vision and your growth along the way. And I think that's a learning that, you know, or surround yourself with mm. people who have done that. So yep. you get that guidance and that support. I think it's really important. Like I have a board now when I set up new companies, cause I am a serial entrepreneur, you know, people like, oh, you're setting up a board this early in the company. I think it's a great thing to have because it holds you accountable. And it also gives you people who have a lot of experience in the areas that you might not to round you out, to lean in and help you. As Horst always said, the founder of Aveda to me, you know, one piece of advice is always surround yourself with great people. So going back to your question, it's not just about knowing when to pivot on strategy it's knowing when somebody's not the right fit and when mm. it's time to move on from them. And I think, you know, one weak link energetically as well can hold the whole company back. That's really good advice. Maybe rewind like 90 seconds and listen to that on loop a couple of times. That's perfect. So to your point, you're a serial entrepreneur. So, you know, it's not just the Institute. So uh, we then have under the canopy that gets started. So talk a little bit about what that business was, how it was founded and the, uh, the purpose and the mission behind that. Yeah. So, you know, when I was running IIN and I was doing consulting, um, you know, we were, we were not just a educational uh, certification. We had a cafe, we had um, consulting for people and a number of other things, a little store and, a, and an organic spa for, with Aveda. So one day I was, I got this call and I was pregnant with my daughter and I got this call and this woman said, yeah, um, there's this uh, client, there's this, my boss, she has this issue. She can't get pregnant. She's been trying for six years. And somebody told her maybe if she changes her diet and lifestyle, she'll get pregnant. And she, um, she'd love to meet with you. And so I had already been thinking about the whole lifestyle equation because I kept stumbling upon and people were knew what I did for a living. So they were like reaching out to me and like, Hey, can I tell you about this product or this thing I'm doing? And I, I, so I, I sort of had this holistic or this ecosystem around me and I started hearing a little bit more about textiles or fiber. And then this princess was, as it turned out, a member of the royal family of Saudi Arabia, started working with me, got her turned on to organic and natural foods, got her turned on to organic and natural beauty products. She actually got pregnant. And then she came to New York. We started shopping together on Fifth Avenue. And she was like, what about fashion? And it sort of converged with where I already was having these moments, right? Like where I learned that cotton is an important crop in organic agriculture, but very, one of the most heavily sprayed at the Mm. same time that I was seeing the beginnings of fiber come to life at the same time that this happened with the princess. And it all sort of, I had this epiphany and I was like, this is like, wait, nobody's talking about fashion and textiles. And I got best dressed in high school. Like that's my big fashion background. I always (laughs) always loved fashion and I was a fashion consumer. Like I, you know, everyone always would say to me, Marcy, will you go shopping with me? Cause they loved how I would like dress them and style them. And so it was kind of in my blood as well. And I was like, oh. And so I filed a trademark on the term eco fashion in 1995. And people thought I was crazy. They're like, okay, Marcy, those worlds don't go together. They're two dichotomous worlds. Why would people 
care about, you know, people who care about fashion don't care about the environment and vice versa. But because I had been in the school, working in the school, I recognized there was something even bigger than food. Yeah. And so therein lies the birth of a bunch of the canopy, because what inspired me was, number one, the canopy is the top layer of the rainforest right? If anyone's ever been to a rainforest. So yeah. there's more life living under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem than anywhere else on this planet. That's yeah. creating the oxygen that we depend on to breathe. Over 50% of our world's oxygen comes out of the rainforest from under the canopy. Second, uh -huh. in, Na in Native American philosophy, the canopy is the ozone layer and meant to protect us. So we have to protect the canopy, right? Because we mm -hmm. all live under the canopy. And yeah. so as I started to think about you know, this bigger picture that you're not just what we eat, we're also what we put on our bodies and around our bodies and the air we're breathing and the water we're drinking. And this is so much bigger than food. Yeah. And therein lies sort of the birth of Under the Canopy as a lifestyle brand started by going direct to consumer back in the day when direct to consumer was mail order catalog, <laughs> not the internet. And so I started telling that story of connecting food, fashion, and beauty. We had Aveda, we had photo shoots at Aveda salons, photo shoots at Whole Foods markets. And the first collection of Under the Canopy was men's, women's, kids, baby, and home right out of the gate. So it was about the lifestyle. It wasn't like, hi, I'm creating a fashion, you know, women's contemporary fashion brand. It was always about a lifestyle. It yeah. was always about telling that story of connecting the dots. And so fast forward, you know, under the canopy, um, started as mail order. And then my first two wholesale clients to go beyond mail order were Whole Foods and Aveda. Yeah. I wrote the business plan for Whole Foods um, to get into textiles and, and a big pivotal juncture, a moment in my life that I will never forget for the rest of my life was March 3rd, 2005, the day that under the canopy launched a 2000 square foot store in store at Whole Foods Market's first mega store in Austin, Texas. And yes. that set that set me on my way for the last, you know, 20 years, really. Yeah. So thinking about that, you know, getting 2000 square feet in, in that business, there's probably a lot of competition for that. You know, what was it about your plan, your conversation with them that you think just connected the dots and it opened up the door for you opposed to somebody else or some other business with them? Yeah. So in 1999, um, the president of Whole Foods, Walter Robb, hired a guy that was tasked with creating this new concept for Whole Foods that was called wholepeople.com. Mm. And this is before the internet bubble burst, but it was at the very, very beginning, right? Yeah. So Whole Foods raised $37 million to create wholepeople.com. And this was going to be their internet platform yes. that was going to have food. It was going to have beauty. It was going to have other categories. It was going to be their test to go beyond food. And because under the canopy was a mail order catalog with every category, men's, women's, kids, baby, and home, we were the perfect drop-in turnkey model for that goal and that vision. So Walter put me in that sort of role of bringing under the canopy to life in partnership yeah. with Whole Foods. It was a very exciting opportunity. Well, fast forward when the internet bubble burst, $37 <laughs> million later, the, you know, the well dried up, nobody was throwing more money into .com because they just were like, it's too early. It yep. was like, you know, people were spending massive amounts of money on infrastructure, but no, there wasn't, there weren't any customers yet. Yeah. So they paused on that strategy, but they took their learnings and said, Let's open a brick and mortar mm. that has all these other lifestyle categories. And I was already in the door. So yeah. that became sort of, we then started to brainstorm and work together on like, what would that look like? And when I tell you, they said to me, here's 2000 square feet in our first megastore. They were going from 30,000 to 80,000 to, you know, 80. Up. Yeah. And so it was a big leap for them. And they said, here's 2000 square feet. It's yours. Do whatever you think. So I literally worked with the Whole Foods team. I wrote the signage. I bought, you know, it was under the canopy, like framed imagery on top of the, in that whole boutique area. We built a dressing room. I wrote my own orders. I mean, this is like a dream for, this is my first wholesale client, you know, and we, a seven figure opening order, literally. And, you know, we had every category, loungewear, men's, kids, 
you know, t-shirts, dresses, skirts, baby onesies, the whole gamut in this, in this shop and shop. And it was so successful out of the gate. Like we didn't anticipate this. Like Walter yeah. and I were like, okay, if this works under the canopy, we'll, you know, build this out in all the future mega stores. Yeah. But we never expected it to be so successful that all of a sudden every region in Whole Foods wanted to retrofit their existing stores to fit under the canopy in. So suddenly I went from zero to a hundred percent of Whole Foods stores in six months where I was flying all over the country, meeting oh. with their regionals and mapping out, here's a four foot set, here's an eight foot set, here's a 12 foot set, here's another 2000 square foot, you know, footprint for yeah. a new store. Like literally I, you would think I worked for Whole Foods because for like almost, almost two years, I spent a lot of time driving that initiative and we got seen by every other retailer at the time, yeah. Target, Macy's, Bed Bath & Beyond, and they started calling me too. So suddenly I found myself in the C-suites of the biggest retailers in America because Whole Foods was being watched as the leading innovator. So every retailer that carried textiles all of a sudden was like, wait a minute, Whole Foods is carrying organic textiles. We need to carry organic textiles. So then under the canopy, I spearheaded the first organic textiles into every retailer I just named and many others. Wow. All under the canopy. Under the canopy was like breaking every rule, like master class. Like we were in Barney's and we were in Target. You know, we were in... <laughs> Like we were, we were, you know, really expanding and growing and I was raising yeah. a lot of capital along the way and IE, you know, grew the company significantly. And then I exited in 2009. Yeah. So we, we could do a whole episode just on that one business and, and the growth of it, but for the sake <laughs> of the scope of today, you know, you talk about issues with the clothing industry and you mentioned cotton, but you know, another one that I think is pretty widely understood is just dye in the way that that is impacting countries and how that works. So, you know, for you, what are a couple of the big changes that, you know, having the eco-friendly fashion, you know, it is changing and allowing to be different than maybe the way it had been prior to? Sure. So I would say the, the key um, touch points for me are looking at Ant ecosystems, so land and, and ocean ecosystems, um, as well as circularity, like the cradle to cradle principles of what we take from the earth, we have to give back to the earth. So building on that, my passion point, I call myself a soil junkie, is the expansion of organic and regenerative agriculture, yeah. but leveraging the power of fashion and textiles. So a third of the world's textiles are made from cotton. We all wear cotton, right? We, we use cotton at night on our bed sheets and our towels and our robes. We, we have t-shirts and denim and, you know, our cotton dress shirts, our dresses. This is a cotton velour sweat dress, you know, sweatshirt dress. I mean, so, you know, cotton is a very important crop in agriculture. And when you look at the way conventional cotton is being farmed, it is not sustainable on any level and we can, business as usual can't continue. Why? Because number one, cotton uses the worst, most carcinogenic chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, people, the implication is, well, we're not putting it in our bodies so we, we can use all those harsh chemicals because right. we're not eating it. And so it, it's the biggest user of like Roundup and which contains glyphosate, which is cancer causing. So just purely from the degra degradation of the soil and the soil ecosystems, destroying yeah. the soil through these very toxic sprays and GMO seeds, we are at a point now where we've basically destroyed the soil. The soil is the skin of the earth right? It's meant to protect us by sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. So soil can be a part, one of our greatest solutions to climate change. Yeah. So I look, I, what I've learned and what I've built and what I look at is not just how can we do less harm, but how can we do more good? How mm. can, since we know that cotton is so important, how can we use cotton as a force for good and be a part of the solution instead of the problem? And then, so for me, you know, everything we do is made from either organic and or regenerative and conversion to organic cotton. So that's a big one. The second yeah. thing is other fibers and materials that are also considered preferred fibers. They're, they're eco-friendly because they're made from natural materials. They're broken yeah. down using non-synthetic ingredients would be like tensile lyocell and other fibers like that made from eucalyptus yeah. Yeah. Um, and then recycled fiber. So anyway, the, the land and, and ocean ecosystems is a big one. Circularity, meaning 
let's stop producing synthetic virgin synthetic garments because every single synthetic garment in the history of mankind is just shedding little plastic microfibers in our washing machines that are going into our oceans through mm. you know the water systems the rivers and into the oceans where today you'll see statistics as high as 90% of fish are throwing are showing traces of plastic microfibers which wow. we're putting back in our bodies right <laughs> so there's all this connection even cotton people don't yeah. know 60% of a cotton plant is going in the food stream because mm -hmm. when you break, when you gin out all the seeds, they get broken down and made into cottonseed oil that go into food products. Wow. And thereby we're consuming cottonseed oil, which is rampant with the worst chemical pesticides. So it's, it's understanding all that interconnection and in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our first basic need is food, but yeah. our second basic need is shelter and clothing. So it's understand that interconnection and how we connect the dots of all of these different sectors from agriculture to popular culture. Nailed it. There it is. So you mentioned earlier that you, you transitioned from under the canopy and beyond brands comes next. So talk a little bit about once again, the mission and, and what was behind that. Yeah. So after I exited under the canopy, um, I was, or even while I was still doing under the canopy as a consultant, actually, because I did exit and then I got brought back in for, as a consultant for another mm -hmm. like chapter two of under the canopy. But at that time I was consulting with a number of other projects. So my husband was doing consulting as well on beverage supplements, plant medicine and other CBD and other therapeutics. Um, and so we decided to bring our worlds together of food, fashion, beauty, and yeah. then, you know, beverage supplements and, um, you know, life, other lifestyle products. And so we came together, we created Beyond Brands as a conscious consulting agency, again, with the philosophy of one plus one equals 11. Yeah. We're stronger together than we are apart. It's all about co-creation right? That's the name of the game, right? Eco-creation. Yeah. So we built, we built a collective. There's about 30 partners, you know, and in the collective, um, and we serve across all lifestyle categories. And one of the brands that we birthed from within, um, beyond brands is called good catch. We partnered with the private equity group. We started good catch together. We were the operators. I was the CMO and co-founder. My husband was the co-founder and CEO. And then the private equity was the co-founder and provided the money. Yeah. And we exited, my husband and I exited good catch um, in 2019, the end of 2019 um, in the series B round. And we, um, we created the first plant-based seafood brand. We kind of riding in the wake of beyond meat. Yeah. Um, and now good catch is selling worldwide and, um, and really it's defining, you know, the next frontier, which is, you know, plant-based and people being more mindful, not just of, you know, again, what we're putting in on and around our bodies, but how every choice plays a role in, you know, protecting human and environmental wellness and future generations and our environment, our environment. I love it. That's so cool. And yeah, what a, what a neat mission that is. And, and it, to your point, it's growing so rapidly. So you mentioned, and beyond brands, going, I'll just add on yeah. that, you know, because we're like these serial entrepreneurs that love, we love to create and we love to drive change. Now beyond brands also has an accelerator called beyond skew. And we are brewing the next generation of brands. We work with young entrepreneurs um, and we have cohorts every season. Um, so now we've got all kinds of brands that are coming to market that we have a hand in. And one of our other house brands, ironically, kind of fits what, with how you kicked off this interview, which uh, is about chocolate. So our next, our next big um, in-house brand is called Good Sam. And it is uh, all regenerative and organic chocolate and other snack foods, nuts, and um, all, you know, from the farm all the way to, you know, what you, what you buy and, and Thrive Market is actually an investor also in Good Sam. And uh, so it sells, you know, of course, nationwide on thrivemarket.com. Wow. Go check that out. And I'm sure Marcy bonuses are just strictly in chocolate for you. Any, <laughs> any compensation <laughs> strictly in chocolate. So, so you mentioned that you wrote your book and, you know, I'd love for you to just highlight, um, you know, a little bit about the book. We're going to encourage people to go check out the book, but highlight a little bit about it and, you know, why it was important for you to write that and, and share it with the world. Sure. 
So right behind me, right? Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy, and sustainable world. The whole idea is a renaissance is a rebirth. Right. So we're in this time where we're experiencing a rebirth of humanity, Mm. right? This awakening, this transformation where we're really coming full circle and remembering who we really are. And the pandemic, if anything, was an accelerator of the eco renaissance because it reminded us how important health and wellness and family and community right, really are. And the eco part of eco renaissance obviously is connected in the sense that we are all part of an ecosystem, not just with each other, our global community, but also with our environment. Mm -hmm. We are not outside of our environment. We have a symbiotic relationship with our environment. We breathe out carbon and nature breathes in carbon and breathes out oxygen, which we depend on to survive, right? To breathe in oxygen. So that interconnection is fundamental to an eco-renaissance, this rebirth and remembrance of who we are. And the idea is through the lens of design, we can change the world. It's all Mm -hmm. about, you know, as Albert Einstein once said, we can't solve today's problems with the same consciousness that created those problems. Mm -hmm. So we have to design new systems like Buckminster Fuller would say, right? It's about, you know, we have to look at, giving people what they want. And I spoke to this at the beginning, right? The yes, right? Yeah. The, and I kick off my book with, you know, the whole philosophy around yes, Dan. The yes is, you know, taste, it's scent, it's style, it's business profits, it's the things that people want and give them all the things that matter, social and environmental responsibility, climate action, you know, um, fair trade, organic and regenerative agriculture, circularity, all the things that are going to make a difference. And it's about five pillars that are connecting all of these spokes in the wheel of change. Creativity, because we're all creators and we can create whatever reality we wish to see. We created everything that we are experiencing. (laughs) Consciousness, because we have to climb that ladder and see things from a different perspective, right? The Mm. higher you get, right? Yeah. Commun- community, the, the realization that we're all in this together and connection, right? That we're all connected. And then it's like the butterfly effect. One action creates a reaction, mm. right? Yeah. And then, co- and then collaboration because we're stronger together than we are apart. And therein lies the co-creation and where everybody is waking up today. We're, we're collaborating, not just within our industries, yeah. but across industries because we're right. telling the same story about yeah. driving change. And so we can create that exponential shift. And I always say we're in this modern day Star Wars right now where the dark and the light forces are kind of fighting each other. They're at odds, different, you know, different perspectives of the way the world is. And we have to turn on the light. And therein lies an eco renaissance. Why I highlight 40 people that I call my Illuminatus. (laughs) <laughs> These are people who are, they're leveraging their own personal platforms to turn on the light and drive change. People like Stella McCartney and Amber Valletta and Lauren Bush, and just a lot of really amazing people that are really, you know, whether it's across food, business, you know, beauty, wellness, art, or fashion, right? Yeah. These are all of the different sectors that I speak to in the book. Yeah. Well, and I think something that's really important is, you know, just even helping people connect the dots of what you were doing earlier with like cotton, just using that as a very simple example. It's something you interact with daily, but you don't think about the eating part of it or, you know, the digestation of it, but inevitably that's happening. Um, And as you were talking about that, it made me think, so I had a gentleman named David Zock on and his mission is sex trafficking. So once again, you know, you get that purpose and it's the thing that you really want to change. And he goes, once I make you aware of it, you now have the choice to change it, right? Because before you just may not be aware of it. And so, you know, I, I can't, I can't, you know, blame you for that. But once you're aware of it, now you're making a choice to either support something or, you know, to not support something. And, and therein lies what you're doing, right? You're educating people. So that way they can make the conscious decision to change what it is we do. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you can go to school for art, technology, business, you know, real estate, whatever you want. Right. But where do you go to learn about what's the most important thing (laughs) that we have? Right. Which is your health. You know, we hear it sounds very cliche, but if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. I mean, look how many people and I don't make light of what just happened the last two years with the pandemic. But, you know, listen. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying this is because of my lifestyle choices, but like, hey, I'll just point it out. I got COVID twice. I got the, you know, tested and I was completely asymptomatic both times. 
Yep. I only knew because I was traveling that I tested positive. Right. But, but the truth is, is like, I really believe that, you know, you do have a large responsibility for your own state of health and well-being and that yeah. of the world around us, because yeah. we are all in this together, but it, but true change starts at the individual level. Yeah. So I do think that that awareness that you just mentioned, it's about, you know, it's about understanding that, you know, everything we choose, you know, every state, and I talk about this a lot in my book, right? Everything you put in on and around your body is an extension of who you are. Mm. Yeah. That's Every good. choice you make. That's so good. So, you know, you talked about how important the relationship with what it was Horace, right? The founder of Veda. Yeah. With Horace yeah. was to you. And it's so cool to see that come full circle with you now having a, you know, incubator, you know, Y Combinator type idea and being a mentor for others. And so talk just a little bit about that shift of, you know, it, you were them at one point with the mentor and now you're in that, that mentoring role to a mentee. Yeah. Well, listen, you know, I realized um, both as a student, as well as a teacher that, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And I think it's really important to, as a strong leader, to recognize where your strengths are, but also understand where your weaknesses are and yeah. don't be afraid to reach out and get that help because, you know, there's a lot of people that have already learned those lessons. So why learn them on, you know, especially if you have the opportunity yes. to leverage those learnings from other people. And I think as a mentor now of Beyond Skew, I realize as I'm speaking to our cohorts, you know, the value of my learnings. And I want to pass that torch because at the end of the day, they share that vision, you know, that I have yeah. and that I continue to have that we're all in this together. And we, it's like all hands on deck right now. We all have to be a part of the solution. So I think, you know, it's really important to find people that resonate for you as a student and yeah. also, I mean, I get outreach all the time um, from, come from you know, individuals who want me as a mentor. Obviously, my time is so limited. That's why I wrote my book is to yes. say, like, here's like, you know, a lot of content. Just read yeah. this. But also, you know, to, to make sure you ask, you know, yes. I, don't, I can't always say yes, but, you know, sometimes they do. And I try to dedicate a portion of my time, not just giving back through business, which is my everyday life, but also, also through additional service. I serve on boards. I do mentoring. I do a lot of public speaking, um, you know, and so this is kind of for me, I'm trying my best to, you know, this is my calling. So I'm trying my best to like really activate, educate, engage and, and inspire people everywhere I can. I love it. Well, Marcia, are there any other things you just want to highlight or any other pivotal moments that stick out to you that you'd like to share with, with our listeners? Well, I mean, I think Eco Fashion Corp, where I am today, yeah. is at a really exciting moment in time because when I started the company two years ago, you know, again, 30 years in the making, um, you know, this, this movement was still really trying to break out and you know, food obviously has crossed over into the mainstream. I mean, the largest buyer of organic food today is Costco. It's no longer Whole Foods, wow. right? Yeah. So, you know, when I look at when I started, it was really to be a solution provider and MetaWare, which is our B2B manufacturing platform in right before COVID hit, I went to India for a month and I opened an office in India, set up our supply chains, which were really supply chains I've been building for 25 years, yeah. started a farm project right, which is called RESET, which stands for Regenerate the Environment, Society, and Economy Through Textiles, and then came back and really started to cultivate the market and build on my consulting practice. And now we're at this moment in time where our greenhouse of brands at Eco Fashion Corp, all the engines are revving because from business to personal consumers, everybody is now drinking the proverbial sustainability, health and wellness Kool-Aid. Yeah and seeking like, where do we go? And so we're seeing an incredible uh, trajectory in our, in our pipeline at MetaWare, but also our two house brands that are on QVC, mm. Seed to Style and Farm to Home. So a big wake up moment for me was going live on QVC, which I've been doing for this past year regularly, yeah. meeting you know mainstream consumers where they are speaking about sustainable fashion and home. Never thought I'd see that day, but always envisioned it and hoped for it. So this is really you know a testament to where the world is to go on you know live TV, speaking about organic sheets and organic clothing on QVC to 100, yeah. 200,000 people a minute, you know, and then you've got, you know, yes, and 
which yes. we just launched, which is joinyesand.com. And that is our platform for collaboration, community, consciousness, creativity, and connection, mm. all the principles of the eco renaissance, where we're partnering up with NGOs like the Women's Earth Alliance or Ram Das or the Rodale Institute and celebrities, influencers, brands, and we're bringing their visions to life, making sustainability easy. So lots more to come. So follow me at Marcy Zeroff and follow Yes And and follow um, MetaWare Organic and Seed to Style and Farm to Home and check us out, ecofashioncorp.com or marcyzeroff.com. Lots of ways to you know jump into this journey and, and enjoy the ride. I love it. Well, Marcy, I want to say thank you so much for your time and just sharing your story and how you've gotten where you're at. I mean, I just think of, yeah, high school fashionista, <laughs> lemonade stand into starting multiple businesses. But I think the core thing at the center of it all is once again, just that purpose and passion you have for the project. And it's amazing to see that because once again, we didn't get to jump into it, you know, the, the dark days of business or the hard times of any of the businesses, but inevitably there was a lot of those and, you know, things didn't Part just two. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we'll tee it up. Well, I'll email your people. We'll get it teed up, but yeah. And so with that purpose though, it's really just driven everything for you. And so, you know, once again, I, I applaud you and the mission you're on and, you know, I'm hoping that a lot of people here listening today will be able to take this and make some changes in their own personal life as well. So thanks again for Thank being on. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Phil. Have a wonderful weekend. Happy Friday. <laughs> <laughs>